I'm going to move this real quick because I'll knock it off. It's tough being handicapped. <laughs> my, my name is Chris Raymer. I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic. I, I am honored to be here. This is. I got to thank everybody that helped me get here. Eileen helped us with the tickets. I don't know. Everybody's got their own little job. You know, it takes that. Tim asked me years ago to do this, and I mean, it's scheduling has been a, been crazy. And and uh, I don't. I guess I, I, people have asked me over the years, "Have you ever been to Aspen? Have you ever been to Aspen?" And I, you know, no. It's like, so what? You know, no, I haven't been to Aspen. I was like, I. Was like, I I'm just gotta say, I owe y'all an amends. I, I, I. Uh, no, you know, you get up in there. I don't care where you talk. You can be talking in Amarillo, Texas. This is a beautiful part of Texas. This is, you know, you'd be very complimentary from the podium. Damn, buddies, listen, Aspen. You know, if you if you ever wonder where Jesus lives when he's not really busy, I, I just, golly, I. There's a lot of pretty places. I get to travel a bunch. I, I, I. I got sober November uh, 13th, 1987, and I, I, uh, I've been working in treatment center business. I do clerical work for treatment centers and I have for 20 years, and, and I just got a chance. I started speaking from the podiums and got the chance to do that. And so, you know, you get to see all parts of the world, and there's some gorgeous places out there. Uh, uh, damn, I mean, what a place y'all live in. I, don't, I can't imagine what it would cost to live here. Good heavens. I'll ask Jesus. <laughs> Joe did great. He picked me up. He picked me up. The 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 crux of this deal. Let me look at the clock because I've got to show him that the Texas boys know how to watch the clock. Okay, I got that. I don't want to over overstay my welcome. Joe picked picked us up on time, and if he can get me back in the airport in the morning on time, then it's, this has been he sure have been a great uh, a great host. Uh, some of these hosts that some of these little conferences are they're not really great. They're little little soul suckers. You can't turn around without them being right there. You know, and so. <laughs> And they want to tell you their story all weekend long. It just drives me crazy. And so I just, I've been honored to get a chance to visit with some of you guys. And um, I'm delighted. I talked to Patty, my wife, right before we came over here, like I always do when she's not with me. And uh, uh, she says, uh, tell y'all hi. And uh, I'm going to rub it in. But next year, we're going to try to come on our own dime. This is because I this she'd love this. And um, I don't know. We... Uh, we celebrated our 10th year wedding anniversary last weekend in Houston. I had to do a talk, and she came over. She's a troop. She's an AA, too, long time, 21, I don't know how long, 21 years or something like that in sobriety. And she, uh, we go to meetings together, and it's just the hoodest. I, I was talking to somebody earlier. I said, well, my husband goes to meetings over here, and I go to meetings over here. And I, God, what a crying shame. You know, I, I don't know. I, 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 this is my wife. This, not this speaking stuff, just in the fellowship, the guys I sponsor, and I sit in my little home group at the, at the outpost. I actually live in Ingram, Texas. I, I've lived in Austin on and off, but I live in Ingram, Texas, and have for forever in a little old small town over there on, on I-10, just west of San Antonio. And if any of you guys ever get a chance to get down there, you're lost, probably. <laughs> I don't know why anybody would go there, but... But you can stop by the outpost. We have a little recovery club. I serve on the board of that little thing. And there's a little, little AA Beaton's Ingram Solution group meets there. And, and uh, it's the best. I get to sit next to my wife. And, and uh, I watch the guys that I'm sponsoring. I'm watching them watch her girls that she's sponsoring. You know how that goes. And it's the best. It's the best. We have a charmed life. And uh, uh, every bit of it is a direct result of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. So I want to... I want to get into this. Um, I want y'all to understand before I get in uh, very far into this that I'm I'm here to share my experience uh, with Alcoholics Anonymous. I my experience uh, will be different than your experience, and it's amazing to me sometimes. Uh, I've, like I said, I've done this a long time. And amazing how how close-minded some alcoholics can be. I don't. That's not may come as a shock for some of you. You know, we we ask the little newcomer. You know, Joe. You know, you got to be open-minded and willing. You know, and and then about five years, you can just slam your mind shut. You know, anything is. Uh, if I say something that your your counselor didn't agree with, well, then he's wrong. You know, and it's like, guys, I'm going to say some stuff on this podium that you don't agree with. So what? I'm here to share my story. 
and 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 I and I got to do that. I mean, I'm I'm not going to make up anything. I'm just I'm going to tell you like it is. I, Doug did. We got the chance to do the little workshop this morning, this afternoon, and it was fun to get to do uh, share the podium with the other speakers. And you know, he said something. It was it was. I mean, it's the truth. You know, guys, if what you're doing is working for you. <laughs> you don't need a little one-eyed guy from Texas come and tell you what how to change it up. If if you're sober and you're happy and you're kicking butt, rock on. My heart goes out to the cats that are around the fellowship that uh, who haven't kept up with the progression of their illness and uh, you know they haven't worked a step and they haven't done much of anything else and they're uh, asking themselves if this really is 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 worth it. Uh, I don't think it's okay to be in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and be miserable. There's something wrong. And that's where I was for so many years. And that's 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 all I'm, I'm gonna, I want to share with you is that, that story. You you got I come, you know, I, again, I, I work in the hospitals and I, I get a chance to love on lots and lots and lots. You know, y'all get a chance to come in contact with a, with a few hundred drunks every year. I, 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 I'm in contact with thousands of drunks and, and, and every year. And, and I get to watch a lot of them come. Most of the folks that come to treatment goes, I don't know if y'all realize this or not, but they've been to AA before. And uh, I, I've had this experience a thousand times. I've told it from the podium a bunch of times. And little knucklehead will come in, you know, and he's all detoxing. About the time he's starting to come off that stupid Ativan, you know, he'll be looking around for something to eat. And, you know, I'll take him to the little cafeteria and get him a Pop-Tart and a Big Red. And, you know, <laughs> you know if, listen, if any of you guys ever have to detox somebody, don't worry about the Ativan. Pop-Tart and Big Red. I I don't know what it does, but that, that it'll it'll change you. Don't spill it because it'll stain everything you touch. But this little guy's eating. He's got big red all over his mouth. You know what I'm saying? He's looking around and all his eyes focus up. And we got some steps on the wall and the traditions. And he looks up and he goes, oh, man, no way. I said, I figured for this kind of money, we get something besides the 12 steps. And I said, buddy, no, really? No kidding. I says, how come? He says, buddy, I've done the 12 steps. I mean, I've, I've been in AA. It doesn't work. See, that's the stuff that breaks my heart. Because you see, I know for a fact, and in just a short conversation, I'm going to find out the truth. He's been to meetings in AA. And he's never worked the steps. He never got a sponsor. He never stayed in all three parts of the legacy. And he damn sure never sponsored another alcoholic. And that's why he's not sober. AA works perfect. I've never known anybody. And I've known some knucklehead fools, I guarantee you. I've never known any, I've never known anybody that came and did all three parts. I don't even care what kind of attitude you bring to it. I don't care if you work the steps perfect. I don't even care how you do it. Just do it. And the miracle starts to take place. And this thing called a spiritual experience is absolutely real. I got a lady in my group. I introduced myself as a recovered alcoholic because the big book says I should. And, and she says it at, 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 our, at our home group all the time. She says, God's grace is continual. I don't have to walk on eggshells every day because those, those old 10 step promises have come true and I've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. All I got to worry about is how much joy am I going to squeeze out of each day? How many cool things, how many, how, how many envelopes am I going to push in my lifetime? God, that's what it's about. I'm this little, little, little fried pie on seven medications a day when I tried to commit suicide, watching a little black and white TV. My life was over at 35. I'll tell you a little bit about it, but I'm I'm as passionate about recovery as you can get. And I, I just, whatever path you're working, if it's working for you, that's great. Sometimes I just, I feel lost in my own fellowship sometimes, you know, because anybody see? <laughs> if you think this is a really cool cover for a grapevine, you're going to hate this talk. <laughs> We were talking about it at the little deal today at the at the little workshop. Uh, Rich had mentioned it, and I and I I've got a sticker on the back of my book. If you ever want one, email me, and I'll send you some some of these stickers. I have them made by the thousands. Uh, it's one of the cool things that God <laughs> lets me do with my money. I get to, to you know make cool stickers and stuff and give them away to people. And, I don't know, a little cheesy maybe, but it says this is an excerpt from a letter that Bill Wilson wrote in 1942. It's in, in as Bill sees it, you can look out there on the table and look at it. And but it, but the, but the but the letter says it says our chief responsibility to the newcomer is an adequate presentation of the program. 
See, it means means I don't know who I'm going to see in this room again. All I know is, let's say you're at my home group and I see a little newcomer coming in. I got to make sure that I fulfill what I'm supposed to do. My primary purpose, we just read it in the traditions. My, the fifth tradition tells us that we've got one primary purpose and that's to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. One One, one, not a lot, one primary purpose. And that's to make sure that little knucklehead that walked through the door understands what this program is about. Whether he stays or not, buddies, I don't know. Who knows? I, they, we come and go. It's a revolving door out there. What the heck? But I, the only way I can sleep at night is to know that the little guy got the message, that he understood that it was about the 12 steps and the ensuant spiritual experience that removed the obsession to drink. And if all we're doing is this, and we don't happen to be talking about the solution at this, then we're not giving him the adequate presentation that he needs. Y'all follow? Some of your heads are spinning already. I don't know what to tell you. I just feel a sense of responsibility. Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, they went to all this trouble to do the work. I, 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 I want to read something to you. Bottom of page 164. It's, some of y'all were talking about that this week. Last uh, Second to last little paragraph. It says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Second, third step. Buddy, we're as open a room as we can be. You can pray to Mr. Magoo for all I care. I don't care. Pick something. I don't. Uh, how can you be in this area yesterday watching that snow come down and not believe there's a God? I don't care how smart you are. It's pretty cool. Abandon yourself to God. Admit your faults to him and your fellows. What? Fifth step? Making the amends? Clear away the wreckage of your past? Absolutely. Give freely what you find and join us. You shall, uh, we shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. This is He just summed up. These are the 12 steps he just summed up in one paragraph. But our meeting in print... Says no, you don't. All you got to do is just don't drink and go to meetings. <laughs> I got the meetings down. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I love the meetings. I still go to a boatload of meetings. Y'all follow? I got the meeting part down. It's the just don't drink part that I'm having a little problem with. Because <laughs> my book says if you can choose not to drink. You're not one of us. And I hear people in meetings all the time. I got up this morning and chose not to drink. Did you? Really? <laughs> I think the Elks Club needs you. <laughs> I know. Oh, that's terrible. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, we got this idea that it's okay to kind of mix this up a little bit. I'm not knocking meetings. I'm going to tell you about my story. I... Uh, I grew up in, uh, we were born out in Odessa, Texas, out in the oil field. My father was a, was a, a printer in an oil field magazine, and uh, uh, he was a, one of the finest printers you'd ever want to come, a technician. He, this guy was amazing. And uh, I've got a mother who's a professional artist. She's still alive today. It's, I, I work part-time so I can be home in the hill country with her some. She's lost her eyesight a few years back, and, and uh, she's, uh, uh, she can still whip my ass. I, she's, a, she's, a, she's amazing stock. I, I absolutely love to be with her. But uh, uh, I've got an identical twin brother. He's up in Cheyenne, uh, uh, Wyoming tonight doing the same kind of thing I'm doing here. And uh, I've got a little sister that lives over in Portland and a half-sister. And uh, we're raised in the same family. We were talking earlier. Perfect. I mean, nice family. Uh, front row of the Baptist church every time the door was open. No goofy stuff going on. Pops was a drinker. That was it. He was, it just, there was a genetic predisposition. We know that's for a fact. It's okay. It's, this is... This is how it comes down the pike usually. And uh, most of us, I don't care where I'm sharing, all over the world. You know, you can be in Europe or wherever. You can, you can, you can talk to people. Can you see some alcoholism or addiction in your family? And everybody laughs and kicks the guy. Hell yes, you know. You kick my family tree, buddy, and they drop out like nuts in the top. I'm, I'm just, there's a, there's a bunch of Indian blood in my family. And we, we, I, mean, I can be president of AA one day with that lineage. I mean, I, I, quali I qualify, but. But the point I want you to see is that, that so my little sister and my, my older sister, they've never had a problem with alcohol. 
I, my older sister one time asked me, ask, she said, can you go to the store and buy some beer? for the, We're having, they're having a party, a New Year's Eve party, and they were cooking hot dogs and stuff. And I, I said, absolutely. And then she said, oh, will that bother you? Because they still think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be triggered by something and, and drink, you know. And it's like, buddy, I'm, no, that's not going to bother me. Absolutely not. Give me the money. How much you want? She gave me a $20 bill. <laughs> I, I said, I said, how, honey, how many are you expecting? <laughs> and she said, I don't know, I don't know. We're we're we got hot dogs for sixty or seventy. <laughs> You're kind of cheap here, aren't you? I mean, it's twenty. And I went and bought twenty dollars worth of beer. I mean, laughing the whole way. And uh, and I guarantee, you, if you go to her house right now, there's still some of those beers in the refrigerator. It's just. <laughs> Guys, we are not like other people. My mother, I guarantee, I've watched her a thousand times. Some of you have heard me tell it from the podium. She can drink a glass of wine every night at five o'clock. Some doc, she had cancer one time. The doctor said, this would be good for you. You drink a glass of wine. And she does, unless it doesn't taste right. And I've seen her a million times. She'll take her little bony finger and she'll slide that glass across the table. And I know the stuff's fixing to hit the fan. I said, mom, what's wrong? She says, it tastes a little off. Okay, mom. Does that mean you're not going to finish it? She looks at me like I'm crazy, like I got three heads. What? No, she's not going to finish it. She just said it tastes off. <laughs> I don't care if there's a dead cricket floating in it. A cigarette butt? You know what I'm saying? Okay, now come on. I mean, y'all understand what I'm talking about. She... I ain't drinking for the taste. I'm not drinking for the color or the ambient. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get right. And that was years of me drinking before I understood what that meant. I didn't want to get drunk. You talk to those kids all the time. They say, why do you drink? Oh, I drink to get effed up, man. I just want to. That's not why I drank. I, I don't want to get like that. That's when you get a DWI and get have a fight with a girl. I want to get, you know. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Just the right amount of stuff in your system to be John Travolta. That's what I. That's what I want. <laughs> and then Doug will tell you the same step in the morning because exactly what happens, guys. This stuff works. People are always trying to get me. Chris, you have such a high profile out there. We want to get you on this anti-drug and anti-alcohol campaign. Absolutely not. Why would I want to do that? There ain't nothing wrong with that stuff. If you can drink it like a normal person, well, go for it. Because of the genetic makeup. I can't. When I drink alcohol, I can't guarantee you how much I'm going to drink. Sometimes I can just drink a little bit. The craving sometimes can be satisfied with two or three drinks. The book says, can you do it every time? Can you guarantee me every time you put that stuff in your system that you're going to be able to stop? How many times was I going to go, I'm going to go pick this girl up and we're going to have a nice night. And about three o'clock, I start to get uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. I start to get ready, you know, because it takes some of us. A long time to get ready. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm getting right. You know, at three o'clock I open a beer because I'm going to get. I'm going to be John Travolta. And you know, at five o'clock I was John Travolta, except I wasn't. I was picking her up about seven. You know, and I kind of passed the mark up a little bit. You with it? I'm a little sloppy and the patch is a little crooked. And you know, <laughs> uh, was that my intention to do that? Absolutely not. But something happened. My first wife used to come with you, and I'd be sitting down there with a 12 pack of beer all dead around me like that. And she'd walk in and she said, My, you were thirsty this morning. <laughs> <laughs> come on, guys. I mean, the, dull, the dullest of us in here, even Oprah understands that, that little piece. That was not, I like Coca Cola too, but I've never sat down and drank a 12 pack in a morning. <laughs> The craving kicks in and we're off to the stupid races. If that was all we had to worry about, we just keep putting you little knuckleheads in jail and pretty soon you'd say, I'm tired of going to jail. I'm going to quit. I'm just going to not drink. Except the second piece that makes this a fatal illness kicks in. The obsession of the mind. From 23 to 43, if any of you guys are straddling the fence out here, ladies, got you young guys in here, any, anybody out here straddling the fence wondering, I'm not sure if I'm a real alcoholic or not. Because Bill, those are Bill Wilson's words, not Chris Raymer's. Bill Wilson talks about, but what about the real alcoholic? I'm not talking about the little disco drunk. I'm talking about the cat, y'all follow, that says he's not going to do it anymore and does it anyway. 
that mental obsess obsession, that insanity that the book talks about is what the steps in the second step are talking about, to return us to sanity. I don't have to stop myself from drinking. Sanity is returned. I know what that stuff is now, and I don't have to drink it anymore. That's a great place to be. I don't have to hide from it. Ooh, triggers. Oh, my God. How many of you guys drank at night? Okay, you all be careful when you leave tonight. I don't... <laughs> Guys, let me tell you something. <laughs> the reason I drank was not because of the things I was doing. It's the things that I wasn't doing. I got people in here tiptoeing around worried. I can't go home. Why? I drank there. Oh. Where didn't you drink? Y'all not? Look, I've been in the industry for a million years, guys. I'm just telling you. Early sobriety, we can teach you that stuff all, all you want to. If you're going to spend the rest of your life tiptoeing around, you'll follow. Ooh, I can't go near that wine aisle. Then you're not recovered. You're not well yet. Let's finish your amends. Let's get you working with somebody, and I guarantee you, you can come and go any place you want. I, it, it's the nature of the beast. Oh, God, that's what, how, how free do you want to be is what my sponsor used to say. I, I want to be free so I can go do all the cool stuff I've always wanted to go do without having to worry about it freaks me out. Y'all with me? Mental obsession. That, that, that suddenly, when it hits you, oh my God. I ended up in uh, the food business. I was bussing tables at a little at a hotel in Kerrville, Texas, and uh, there was a Swiss chef that owned the place, and they're back there cooking. You know, it's, I still get tingly every time I see a chef in his whites, you know, and, and he's got his checkered pants on, you know, and back there, and he's just, she's slinging skillets, and there's flames everywhere, and it's just, it's, and I'm a little bus boy, I'm back there thinking, God, that's where I want, because all of those guys are getting laid, I got to tell you that for a fact, I'm just saying, I know, I know, I, they're, they're drinking on a job, and they got all the dates they want, you know, and I'm this little skinny guy, and I'm looking, and I says, man, I want to do that, and the guy says, man, come with us, let's talk about it. We went to his little chef's office. I'll never forget it. And he opened a beer and he slid it across the table and says, here, have one. We're, we're still at work. He says, yeah, I know. And I was 17 years old. And he says, but if you're going to work back here with us, you're going to have to drink like us. Hot damn. I mean, <laughs> this is turning out to be pretty cool, you know. Back in the day, folks, folks didn't care if you drank on the job. If you're in the food business, a lot of you guys are like, as long as you can show up and, and do your job and go home and not, not cause them a bunch of headaches, they don't care what you drink. It's just no big deal. Now, that with litigation out there, they, they kind of clamp down on that. But back in the day, you could drink all you want. I thought, this, this is the bomb. And uh, I went off to Houston, got an apprenticeship program, and I was pretty talented. I was pretty good. And uh, uh, I started uh, making a little money and uh, had a nice little apartment with shag carpet. <laughs> some nice green green appliances y'all remember the avocado green appliances oh my god this is before john travolta and uh, it, it was pretty cool beanbag chair you know it was pretty hot and because uh, guys because y'all need to understand because everybody talk laughs about this there's a time when alcohol works i mean people don't understand it. we talk in the meetings non-stop about you know with the when it where the rest and the throwing up and all the bad stuff that happens but there was a time when it worked or we wouldn't be doing it my, I watched my little sister get sick one time, and that was it. I said, at least you want another drink? She says, no, I'm starting to feel it. I don't ever want to feel that bad again. Whew, okay. Can I have yours? Yeah, absolutely. Let's get... <laughs> I mean, that ought to be the question we ought to ask every alcoholic. Did you ever get sick drinking? Uh-huh. Did you ever get sick more than once? Uh-huh. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I, I, we don't need 20 questions. I could still see myself walking out of that bathroom, wiping my mouth. Oh, must have been the chicken. I don't know. I... <laughs> you want another beer? Yes. <laughs> I'm not finished yet. You know, so... I'm doing pretty good in Houston. I'm holding it together pretty good. But by the late 70s, I'm starting to experience a thing uh, that some of y'all are really familiar with called depression. Uh, and it is kicking my butt. And uh, I'm seeing doctors about this depression. The number one symptom of untreated alcoholism, whether you're drinking or not, is depression. Uh, not clinical depression. It's just depression as a result of the illness. And one of the, one of the cool, Bill Wilson talked about it. He wrote about it extensively. He fought it for years, I guarantee you. If you read the history around it. Uh, 
But I'm seeing the doctors and, of course, they're questioning, are you drinking? Yeah, some, a couple, and here we go. You know, so it's the same stuff. And, and uh, uh, But it's starting to affect me in all of these other areas. And um, I finally ended up getting married to this old woman. She was a sweetheart, and uh, 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 she really was a nice girl. And uh, I, uh, uh, a counselor told me one time, he says, Chris, if you want to get sober, you just need to get married. Put some roots down. Luckily, we didn't put roots in the shape of kids down, you know, because that would have been a nightmare. But we just... We got married. I moved up North Texas to be closer to my twin brother, and I took a job at a country club that who, whose chef was a cocaine dealer, and uh, it was working out okay for a while. And uh, <laughs> I'm doing all those other outside issues and drinking like a fiend, and I'm taking seven medications a day. Chris, you're not an alcoholic. You you have a bipolar disorder. So anybody can see that. Chris, you're not. You know, it's bi- you're just manic depressive. You're, you're you know, you've got some schizoid tendencies here. You need a little medication here. And your adult attention deficit disorder was the big one right there. You can't seem to focus, Chris. And we're going to give you some of that. You can chop it up, and snort the daylights out of it later. <laughs> I'm on so many medications, I glowed. <laughs> I came home one night and I was really I was I was. I was banged up, and she said something wrong, and I shoved her. You know, it's, I, I'm one of them old West Texas boys. We just, you don't touch a woman ever like that. And uh, I scared the daylights out of her. I, I just, after the cops left, um, it was just a screaming match. Neighbors were out in the yard and all this, and I'm showing my butt like a big dog, and I, I it's just stupid. And I, she said, what, what, what happened? What? And I said, I just, I did too much cocaine. I did some other stuff. I did just, I'm drinking too much. And she says, Chris, we talked about that. Of course you're drinking too much. She said, but you're going to have to stop. Because if you want to stay married to me, because I'm not ever going to be embarrassed like this again. This is ridiculous. And I'm, and I'm embarrassed. I, you know, I'm what we call one of these functioning alcoholics. Y'all ever heard, heard that expression? See, I see, I'm not going to jail, but I'm periodically, I'm making some good money and then I'll lose that job, lose it. I never got fired from a job, but I'll quit the job because they didn't use the right tone with me. We're, <laughs> Carl was saying the other day, you know, this, we're so hyper vigilant, you know, we're sensitive to everything, you know. I know what she was thinking when she talked, you know, I, I can read minds and it, it's it's stupid, but... And then I'd be eating out of dumpsters in Houston, Texas, you know, and then I'd get a cool little job and a little sous chef job someplace and I'd start making some more money and I'd buy, get a little condo and, you know, it's one minute I'm doing great, the next minute I'm not doing so well. But I'm not having a whole bunch of drama on the outside. And so the families think I'm holding it together pretty well. And um, anyway, I promised her I wasn't going to drink. And I got to tell you, I'm going to uh, reiterate, because uh, all the speakers have alluded to this, uh, I... Uh, uh, when I looked her in the face and told her that I was going to quit, I meant it with every fiber in my body. I am so sick and tired of people painting pictures that every alcoholic out there is a liar. Uh, was there some times that I, I lied? Absolutely. So do the people at the Elks Club. Everybody. It, it, we're, we're no better, no worse than anything. I this addictive personality. You have an alcoholic mind. You have the, it's crap. You have an illness, a disease called alcoholism. And you're loaded with a whole bunch of character defects. <laughs> Let's work on those. Y'all follow? I, it's everybody, every time anybody wants to do it, they blame it on alcoholism. You're cheating on your wife. Oh, it's alcoholism. Buddy, you've been sober 20 years. What are you? Uh, you're, you're an alley cat. What? Are you, I, what, what? You're going to blame it on, on the alcoholism. Alcoholism is about my drinking. That's that's where we need to go with it. Anyway, well, I looked her in the face and told her I was going to quit. I meant it with every fiber. And... Uh, uh, two weeks later, I had had a beer after work with one of the chefs and came home patting myself on the back because I didn't get drunk. And see, but my idea with <laughs> with her was that I wasn't going to touch another drop. And uh, she could smell it from the curb. And she went straight, no word, no nothing, no fight. She just went to the bedroom and packed. I had five more years left in me. Blaming her. She, she, she deserted me. I chased her out of that marriage on the front of a Mack truck. Years later, years later, I was able to make amends to that woman. And when she sat down and listened to my amends, she said, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time. It took me 13 years to track her down and make that amend. She wasn't hearing it for 13 years. When I finally sat down and she says, I'm so grateful that you took time to do this, but you don't have a clue what you did to me. And then she told me. Thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous. 
I'm working for my twin brother up in North Texas, and I'm living in a little crappy apartment that my sister-in-law's had to co-sign for me. I'm driving an old beat-up pickup truck, and I got big old long hair and a big old bushy beard, and I'm... I hate my life. Can y'all can y'all relate to that? I still have this idea in my mind, but you don't understand my case is different. If I could get that job, I'd be okay. If I could get that apartment, I would be okay. If I could get that woman I could be with us, I mean, that's when I got married. If I could just marry that woman, I could be okay. And two weeks later, she's shoveling Cheerios in her mouth, and I'm sitting over there looking. I says, God, if I could just kill this woman, I would be okay. <laughs> And we laugh, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but how many of y'all are like that? You know, that's what a geographical cure. I still drive a pickup because you never know when you have to move again. You know, I, I got to get out of Texas. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Like there's no drinking in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I, I heard a guy yesterday, the exact same thing. He said, Chris, I got to get out of Austin. I just can't. I got to get out of Austin. I said, where are you going to go? She, she said, Houston. <laughs> Good idea. No. <laughs> Good God, I'm not, you, you can't escape it, guys. It's just, it's everywhere. That's not the problem. Anyway, I, uh, I'm working for my twin brother, and I picked up a stack of return checks one night, and uh, um, I've been going to AA, guys, I got to tell you, for seven years. When I, when I was trying to save that marriage, I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous, and this old boy qualified me one night, and he says, he's, when I first showed up, he said, Chris, are you, are you, uh, uh, do you have a desire not to drink? And I said, yes, and uh he was qualifying me for membership in Alcoholics Anonymous. He was not qualifying me as an alcoholic. You'll get the difference. It's two two different things. You anybody can be a member of AA, and R. You know, every I mean, we're we're full of people that may or may not need to be here, but but they're here and they want to be here. They're welcome. I got I got no truck with any of that. Uh, but but he didn't qualify me as an alcoholic. He just said, "Come on in." And so we went around the rooms and it's the same stuff. Y'all heard me talk about it a billion times. Some of you, I. I, uh, meetings were divided into two kinds. We've got problem solving meetings where we talk about your grandkids. Oh my God, heaven forbid. And, and I don't have a problem with that, but that's all we talked about. The other ones were, oh, we got a newcomer coming back. Uh, let's tell Chris how we got here. And I know a lot of y'all like those meetings and we call them ID meetings in certain parts of the country. I don't know what you'll call them up here in God's land, but, uh, ID meetings means that we're going to go around and everybody's going to tell how they got here, which means we're going to get to hear your drunk log and then we're going to hear your drunk a log and your drunk a log and your drunk a log. And I got to tell you guys, if there's anything I say from the podium that's ever misconstrued as controversial, this is what I'm saying. Your story is so important, it's not even funny. Friday night from the podium, like we've been doing this weekend, you better have a good story. Make up some shit. I don't, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> what are they going to do? Fact check it? I don't care. <laughs> In a 12-step call? Doug and I are going to go get this guy over here at Denny's. We're going to talk to him about AA, and he's drunk. He's not going to listen to us until he finds out who he's talking to. He's going to tell him some stories. I'm going to tell him some stories. He says, no kidding. You really did that? Good. You, you just like me. Yes, sir. And somewhere in the conversation, that guy's going to say, but you don't seem to be drinking now. No, sir. I'm not. I've been sober 26 years. No. Yes. How'd you do it? <laughs> it's like fishing. Click easy. <laughs> Y'all see? Really easy. Not too hard. <laughs> when he asked the question, how did you do it? Set, set the hook and reel him in. That's all you got to do. But he never would have nibbled on the, on, the, on the hook if you hadn't given him a story. You follow? Now I got him, and he's coming to a meeting, and now we're going to tell him some stories. And for the first couple of weeks, it's going to be pretty cool. And then my experience, listen to thousands of alcoholics who hate it, they're going to get tired of it just like I did. Really? How did, how did you get here? Let me, oh shit, let me guess. You drank too much. Because we're, we're, listen guys, I ain't going to get off of it for just a second. We're killing women with this. There's thousands of women out there that won't come to Alcoholics Anonymous because they're sick and tired of listening to the stupid stories. One story after another. This guy had DWI. Oh, it's scary. This guy, she, she, she chopped up three people and she's had six DWIs. And this one's been to prison. And this one, been, I'm not making light of any of this. Y'all understand? With a sponsor, with somebody you're working the steps with, and a 12-step call from the podium, tell all the story. I'm just asking, why is it that every meeting we go to, most of the world, we've got to spend it with ID? They're here. There's no chapter in the back of the book called In Scare. Can we share some hope with these cats?
formats. Meeting formats, it's not the personalities. If your meeting format suggests that we do that, then, then I would suggest that some of us as responsible members of AA go back in and change some of these meeting formats. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. Seven years in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous, I can't stay in these rooms. I'm picking up chips. Y'all follow? I picked up so many chips, the last time I picked up a chip, nobody applauded. <laughs> they were so... <laughs> They weren't feeling the love, you know. They said, Chris, could you bring some of these chips back? You're bankrupting us, you know. <laughs> but it's like we were talking about. I do great, guys, for a couple of weeks. I come in and I want to stay sober, right? They, every time one of you little guys relapses, we just blame it on you. Well, you just didn't want it. But the truth is nobody's telling me how to get well. I'll take some responsibility, absolutely. But nobody, I didn't own a book for seven years, never got a sponsor. Nobody ever got in my face and said, Chris, what are you doing, you idiot? You're dying here. Nobody. Oh, you just you you just keep coming to meetings. It'll be all right. Not if you're a real alcoholic, it won't. Guys. I know intuitively that AA works because I see you stay sober. But I can't get sober. 1987, I picked up that stack of return checks in my little apartment. It was November, cold outside. And I walked in there and I, I, I can't, I just, I'm opening these checks and I'm, and I'm bankrupted another checking account. I'm 35 years old. I'm going to have to go back to my sister-in-law one more time and borrow some more money. Y'all understand this? I, you could just, you could just let your family down so many times, you know, and I'm not trying to, to glorify any of this. I just, I got up. I've been to treatment. I, I, I'm on seven medications. I, I, I'm going to your stupid meetings. Uh, I fed the ferrets and uh, watered old sick ivy and uh, stacked those checks on the table and went to the medicine cabinet, took two bottles of pills and tried to die. I got those pills about down to my, down to my top part of my stomach and I heard this voice said, don't do this, go back to AA. And I'm arguing. I kicked the ferret cage. I said, see if the ferrets were talking. I don't know what I heard that night. This wasn't, you know, Carla, this wasn't a thought. Perhaps you should get, you know, interesting hypothesis, this AA. Perhaps you should, it was none of that, this intellectual. I heard a voice that said, I've got emails from all over the world from people that heard that same voice. Sometimes it was a man's voice. Sometimes it was a woman's voice. Don't do this. Go back to AA. And I, I made myself sick. I heard it twice and I laid down on the side of the bed and I conked out. And uh, the next morning I heard it again. And uh, I went to work because that's what I have to do. If I don't go to work, I end up on the street. I've been there and I don't want to do it. And I went to work and got a doctor and started detoxing. And at 6 o'clock that evening, I'm running late. There's a meeting I was going to go to, but I was, I was running too late for it. And so I was going to go to this other meeting, right? This guy at 12 stepped me one time, and he wanted me to go to this meeting. He said, Chris, if you ever want to get sober, go into this meeting right here. He says, they all carry this book right here. Don't go in there without a book because this is a little nest of big book thumpers. And I had no idea what that was about. But I knew you were never going to get a date in that meeting. <laughs> I thanked him for picking me up. I'd come out of a blackout, first blackout I'd ever had. And I, and I thanked him for coming to pick me up, but I'm not ready for that. And so I, and I, and I, I but I was running late. And it was, it was between me and the house. And so I stopped. And I was going to co- go in, let everybody know I'm, I'm back in AA again. And then I'm split. I'm not even going to stay for the meeting. And, uh, and I walked in the back door of that meeting back door because I don't want anybody to know I'm going back to Alcoholics Anonymous because this is so, y'all understand, everybody in, everybody in North Texas knew I was an alcoholic. <laughs> I'd been on the prayer list of every church in town. My mom, had, she'd worked overtime making sure, you pray for Chris Rammer, you pray for, oh my God, bless her heart. And it worked. And I walked in the back door of this club and, and uh, it was one of those, we were laughing with one of the little brothers about one of these smoking meetings. It was back in the day when you could smoke. Some of you old, old geezers remember that. And there was a long tables and ashtrays lined up. And I walked in and everybody's laughing. Again, you remember how high sensitive you are. You know, it's like they're laughing and I know they're laughing at me. I'm checking my zipper, making sure <laughs> what, you know. And the chairperson had waved. He'd seen me up in North Texas seven years in and out of the fellowship. He waved at me, and I, oh, shit. All the meetings in the world, I got to get this guy, you know. And some lady laughed real loud over here, and I said, oh, I, I just can't do it. I didn't even make it to the coffee pot, y'all understand? And I took a step back, and I stepped right on this little girl's foot. She hooked her finger in my belt loop. She swears she didn't come up on my blind side. She did. <laughs> Come on, guys, if she'd have fronted me like this, I mean, I would have, if, if, if Doug had come up to me, I'd have just dust. She said, sit down, cowboy, you're not going anywhere. 
Really? Okay. And she sat me down in a chair. Uh, I've gotten emails from people. You know, women should work with women and men should work. This girl didn't sponsor me, you fool. She stopped me from walking out the door. She understood where her job was in Alcoholics Anonymous and had nothing to do with sex or gender. She was a suffering alcoholic who was sober a year and knew that I was leaving. Her sponsor was across the table, across the way and couldn't get to me. And she pointed, she said, get him. And she hooked her finger in my belt loop and set me down. Y'all understand how God was all over this. If, again, if it had been no hairy leg boy, I'd have just shoved him out of the way. Cowboy this. And I'd have been out the door. I'd have been out the door. I was so self-conscious. I was so embarrassed. I was just so, anyway. And they went around, and I'm spilling coffee, and they're laughing, and they got me a roll of paper towels to clean it up. And the meeting started. The chairperson took charge of the meeting and said, he said, uh, he said, we got a newcomer that's coming back. He's, he's not new. He's been around forever. We're, we're welcome back, you know. Why don't we go around and share how our lives have changed as a result of working the steps? Damn. Really? Guys, with all respect, if he'd have said, let's tell Keith how we got here, I'd have died. Been there, done that. I'm less than 24 hours away from a suicide attempt, and one thing I need more than anything, more than a date, more than money, more than a new car, more than anything, is hope. Again, we were talking about, I need triage, guys. I'm bleeding to death. I got kidney damage and liver damage, and I'm coming undone. I'm... As dirty as I was, as un as unhealthy as I looked, as bad as I smelled. That was the big joke when I first got sober. It says, we didn't know if it was an eye patch or an ear muff. <laughs> kind of <moving> around. <laughs> I don't care if you look like John Travolta. That's not cool. I don't know. But they went around and they did the deal. Guys, we talk about it. One lady talking about going back to school and raising a family. A lady at the end of the table had an art book out. She was sketching some sculpture. And I'm a big fan of art all my life. And oh my God, she'd gone back to art school and she'd done some cool stuff. And little lady hung up some keys and she got a brand new car out there. And you know, some of y'all, I know that's. Well, you think every meeting should be a pep rally? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Guys, there's room for all kinds of meetings. There's room for those, those problem-solving meetings where we talk about the cat and the, the, all the crazy stuff. There's plenty of that. I'm just saying, can't we have equal opportunity? If you look in the meeting schedules in Houston and Dallas, Texas, there's over 1,500 open discussion meetings where we're going to talk about anything that you want to talk about. But if you want a literature-based meeting where we're going to talk about the book, there's 20 meetings you can go to in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in one week. Then it hardly seems right, does it? We wonder why our success rates get a little skewed. I'm just saying, I don't, they don't, I don't think, should I think they, they all need to be, uh, you know, literature-based? No, absolutely not. Folks, the fellowship is the most, I agree with what Doug, the fellowship is so wonderful it's not even funny. But it's no more important than the steps or anything else. I'm just saying, why can't we do a little step study while we're talking about your grandkids again? What's wrong with that? While we're talking about relationships, why can't we talk about how to finish a four-step so that you can get spiritually connected and figure out what you want to do with this stupid relationship? Don't you know? I'm moving. I'm moving on past it. Never mind. Just a th I'm just saying. The old geezer after the meeting, we were laughing our asses off. That's how you could tell a good meeting. And uh, the old guy came up after, and I picked up my desire tip, and he picked up, and he said, Chris, i got to ask you a question. He had them old glasses on I swore I would never wear. And he's looking over these glasses like that, and he says, Chris, i got to ask you what the book asked me to ask you. Are you done? He said, Chris, not one day at a time. Are you done? You're going to live life a day at a time. And you don't even have a clue how to do that. If you'll stick with us, we'll show you how to work the steps and we'll show you how to live a day at a time. We'll show you how to get the good stuff back in your life again. We'll show you, just like on page 132 where it says, you can recover and you'll be given the help, the power to help other people. And I said, I don't believe any of that. He said, Will you do it? And I said, absolutely. The next day we got on our knees and did a third step prayer. And that afternoon after lunch, we got a notebook and started working on a fourth step. People always say, God, it seems a little quick. I'm in AA seven years. <laughs> I 
I mean, it ain't quick at all. I don't know what to tell you. You can't do that with everybody. But, you, uh, but, but, but most of us, the biggest mistake we make in Alcoholics Anonymous today is that we don't qualify the alcoholic, and then we don't get them to the steps while they can. There's a, there's a guy named William White down in Florida who talks about this little window of opportunity, he writes these articles about this. But, and and I, haven't you all experienced it in your own life that there's a little window of opportunity? You come in, and you're feeling pretty good, and you get, get a little food in you, and you start get a little sleep, and you start feeling a little bit better, you know, and everything's going pretty good. If I could get you spiritually connected in that period of time, we wouldn't have anything to worry about. But we have a tendency to want to sit on our butts and tell you to just go to meetings. Don't worry about service work. Don't worry about anything until the crazies come back and you relapse. And then we can just blame you for not wanting it bad enough. Guys, I'm 26 years sober. When the obsession to use comes back, I'm going to drink. I'm not going to call my sponsor. I'm not going to pick up my Gorski relapse workbook grid. <laughs> I'm just not. A guy named William, uh, uh, William James wrote this little book called Varieties of the Religious Experience. Bill Wilson in the big book, he re refers to it a couple of times. If any of you guys, I know some of you, you, you intellects in here have read it. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty easily accessible book. You can get it, but it's a, it's a bear to read. It's not, you're not going to lay out by the pool and flip through it. Like, you know, it's, a, it's a tough read. But one of the things he says, it was, it was taken from a series of lectures he did in, two, in uh, 1901 and 1902. And one of the things he talks, William James talks about is this spiritual, the necessity for the spiritual experience to overcome some of the these illnesses like alcoholism. He talks about, he said, at a certain point when you can no longer tolerate the misery, you're ready. Harry Tebow, uh, Bill Wilson's psychiatrist, he was under, uh, uh, Bill Wilson was under Harry's uh, tutelage when he was doing the 12 and 12. I mean, Bill Wilson was really flourishing at this particular time. And, and Harry Tebow, he wrote in this, in several articles he talks about, he talks about this, this idea about this bottom. He said, you could hit a thousand bottoms, but unless you surrender at that bottom, at one of these bottoms, you're just going to hit another bottom. I mean, come on, guys, how many bottoms did we hit before we ever got to Alcoholics Anonymous and stayed? You can't tell me that I didn't want to stay sober in 1980 when I came to AA. I'm slinging snot. I'm ready to give it up. I'm, I want to stay sober so bad I could taste it. But you scared me out with a war story, and you gave me enough information to separate me from you because I haven't got a DWI. I'm not blacking out. I've never pissed my pants. I've never lost a job. You want to talk about the drama instead of talking about what's going on inside, which are the bedevilments that the book talks about. Guys, buddies, that's what ties us all together. Some of you guys are from Aspen. You live in a, in a, a billion dollar house on the hill. And some of you live in a trailer down the valley. So what? What's going on inside of the millionaire and the guy on the trailer is the same thing. Irritable, restless, and discontent. Bored, a feeling of uselessness, fearfulness, no sense of direction. You will follow? I can talk at a women's prison. I can talk at a, at a lawyer's conference. I can, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference who I'm talking to. As long as they're alcoholics, we can relate. And the minute I start telling stories about eating out of dumpsters in Houston, Texas, passing out in the walk-in, the nice little lady on the front of the road with her Louis Vuitton gets up and leaves because she's never done that. A little of it goes a long way, guys. I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying don't tell your story. It's, I, please. We're killing women with that. We're killing young people with that. If I hit a bottom and I come in here and somebody explains what alcoholism looks like, I'll stay. My bottom was a complete understanding of the first step. Y'all understand? I knew the jig was up when I understood that the mental obsession, I couldn't beat it. That there would come a time I would walk into that 7-Eleven and I would reach for the 7-Up seven, seven and my head would say, you can have one beer. <laughs> how many times? Come on. How many times? And my head will say, no, absolutely. One beer? So I'd always in. And then, I can't, and then I'm drinking a 12-pack. I know. No, uh -uh, absolutely not. What are you, a pussy? <laughs> I'm talking to the lady in the, the cooler next to me. Who are you talking to? Nobody. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I push her out of the way, grab a beer, stop, Chris, put the beer back, grab a quart, 
If it's going to be one beer, it's going to be a big beer. <laughs> I was in the store the other day, and this guy's buying it. Have you seen those beers? They got the little pony keg things with a little little spigot. You can buy them in the store like that. I mean, oh, my God. They're that big. How can you drive with one of those things? between? I don't understand. They're that big around. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No, that's what convinced me. And this guy that night, he called, he qualified me. And he says, oh, damn it, that's me. It didn't matter if I had the woman or not. It didn't matter if I had the cool job or not. Money or no job. It didn't matter. I woke up and was feeling uncomfortable, and a beer would fix that. Make sense? That's what alcoholism is. I, 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 I don't know. Don Pritz, we were talking about him today. I, I, I think about, I'm in that same sponsorship lineage. Somebody sent me an excerpt from the last talk he did. I've, I've heard it years ago and I'd forgotten it. And uh, there's a line in there. He starts talking, I'm paraphrasing because I can't quote it. But he talks about it sometime during uh, our, our history. We pulled away from a, from a recovery fellowship to a sobriety fellowship. You get it? Because it's not the same. At some point in time, we stopped talking about being recovered, kicking butt, being well. And we got to just don't drink no matter what. It all became of, that's the crux. See, that's the beginning. We want you sober, but we want you happy. Two weeks later, I've got a completed four-step, and I'm sitting on the tailgate of my truck, and it dawns on me that the obsession to use is lifted. And um, I'm surrounded by liquor. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've still got the same job and the same old beat-up truck leaning on one side. You follow? But it dawns on me that I don't want to drink anymore. Not, I don't want to drink. It's, I'm done. I'm working the steps, guys. I've got a completed four step ready to do a fifth step, and the guys at the at the group are showing me how to do a ten and eleven, and they and I'm and I'm helping every day at the group. They're showing me, Chris, you know, open the door, meet meet Mr. Hoover, you know, the vacuum cleaner. You know, it's like I'm vacuuming, and I'm just I'm doing service work. That's because alone in my head, I will figure out why it's. I've been in the AA for a month now, and I'm not president, so I'm leaving. You know, and. And I'm sitting on the tailgate, and it dawns on me that the obsession's lifted. And uh, that was 26 years ago, guys. And I've been through some great times and some bad times in recovery. Not once have I wanted to drink. And it's not a pink cloud. That's what recovery looks like. We have a tendency to want to water that down, folks. I got a couple of things I need to mention real quick. I'll let you guys go eat, uh, eat chocolate because I'm going to be right there with you. I got a, a guy in my sponsorship lineage, too, that was up above Don Pritz. He wrote a bunch of articles, and he talked about it in some of his talks. He says, keep it simple doesn't mean keep it stupid. This, this assumption that the newcomer can't handle the truth is ludicrous. It's just an assumption. The truth is, most of us get here so desperate, you could tell us to go stand naked in the corner, and we'd do it. But we miss our little window of opportunity when we let them go sit and do what they've been doing. That's why we got to reel them in while we get it. We may only get one chance at them, one shot at them. And that's, that's been my experience. The old timers didn't, uh, because I don't have time, I, I can't give you the stories, but the, the old timers didn't let me wing it on my own. They did exactly what, I watched one of my sisters in here today uh, Asked somebody to come up and read how it worked, and then opened the book and showed her where it was, and this is on this page, and 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 pointed to her. That's what we. That's what we're supposed to do. We're teachers. You follow? I was in a meeting not long ago, and there was a big, big, uh, big hubbub at the beginning of the meeting because somebody had lost the the, the pallet that had the, the how it worked laminated to it. Nobody could find it, you know. And I'm sitting there like this. I said, "Oh no, it's no problem here." And he looked at me like I'd handed him a, a bowling ball. It's like, he's like, you, you don't. Here, and I turned the page and showed him where it was. Oh, okay. That's not okay. How it works means how it works. This is our marching orders. This is what it tells us to do. You know, it's, they showed me where it was in the book. They taught me how to, how to do it. They said, Chris, would you like to read how it works? I said, no. And after the meeting, he said, Chris, you've been a taker all your life. Guys, I make it sound like they were so mean. You, you need to understand where I'm coming from. These men 
were not mean. These men and women, they loved me enough to tell me the truth. And they didn't give a rat's butt if they hurt my sensitive little feelings or not. They had watched me for seven years suck off the AA tip for free. I could have probably used a better analogy than that. <laughs> but I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you, but you understand what I'm talking about. You understand what I'm talking about. I said, okay. I mean, the guy didn't shame me, but he just said, Chris, we, all we asked you to do, we didn't ask you to, to just read how it works. Participate with us. Be a part of your home group. I mean, I'd sneak up there. They gave me a key to the damn place. And I'd sneak up there in the afternoon. I worked for my twin brother, and I'd read how it worked. I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to read it, and I would make a mistake, and, I would, that, and y'all would laugh at me. Today I'm disappointed when you don't laugh at me. You know what I'm saying? You know, no pirate jokes all weekend long. What's wrong with y'all? I don't understand. Yeah. And I snuck in there and I read it and I reread it and I got it all like that. And he says, the next meeting, Friday night, and he says, okay, well, who wants to read? Oh, pick. He said, well, here, absolutely. And everybody looked around like, oh, my God, Chris is going to do something besides sit on his ass. It handed me, you with us? And I looked down and it was the traditions. <laughs> oh, bastards. And I read it. Did I, did I mess it up? Absolutely. Did they laugh? Absolutely. You don't take yourself so that gum serious, folks. You're going to make mistakes. You're going you're, you're gonna to mess up. So what? We're going to teach you what to do. You get it over your head, somebody next to you is going to help you. But you're going to do it. The guys I sponsor, within three, four months, they're sponsoring. Or I'm not messing with them. I didn't say I'd fire them. I'm just not messing with them. No free rides. Because if they don't see what this is about, they're not going to stay. Let me tell you what's fixing to happen. We're not talking politics here, but what's coming down our way is this little thing called the Affordable Care Act. I don't know if some of y'all might have noticed that on TV. It's amazing how many alcoholics don't watch TV anymore. But anyway, I don't know what it's going to do specifically because I'm in the treatment business. And it, 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 you know, everybody's kind of watching to see what's going to happen. The the smallest guesstimate that we can come up with is that there's going to be a minimum 42, new million, 42 million newly insured people come into our system. Now, the, the grinder is of that, I've seen it as high as 62 million. The grinder with that is that most of these cats that get this insurance are not going to be able to come to the places like I work. I work at a high dollar place. And a lot of the places that I refer to are high dollar, some of them are low dollar. But the places that are going to work, it looks like from all the information we can gather, are going to be outpatient and transitional living. In other words, they'll pay for an outpatient visit or two, a couple of weeks of that, and then we're going to transfer you to a, to a little sober living environment where you can get your feet on the ground. You'll follow? And what they're going to prove is the same thing that we've proved for my 20 years working in the industry. Every patient that I ever had anything to do with that left those hospitals completely detoxed, the ones that got associated with Alcoholics Anonymous and the other 12-step fellowships for them and got a home group and a sponsor and kicking, they stayed sober. You, wow, really? And the ones that walked off the campus and didn't do any of that didn't stay sober. And I'm the cat that did the statistics for the hospital I used to work for for 17 years. You can't live off a spiritual experience you had 25 years ago, folks. I've watched thousands of people have spiritual experiences in treatment and then walk off the campus and, and think they could live off that experience. You can't. I have a spiritual experience because I get to watch my guys do the work with other people. I get to watch what happens when I get off my butt and actually take charge of a meeting and, 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 and nurture some new ones. You'll follow? There ain't nothing like it when you walk into your little AA group. I don't care where it is. You walk in and watch one of your little guys. I've told it from 100 podiums. I'll look around a corner. I'm making coffee because I'm the only one that can make it right. And I'm looking... <laughs> I look around the room and my little boy's back there and I've been sponsoring him for years now and he, he's got him a little new, newcomer and he's got him in the hook and they're, they're talking. He says, okay, open your book. Where's your highlighter? God, listen, I told you, every time we open the book, you got to have your highlight. He's eating this kid's ass because he don't have a highlighter. He says, here, take mine. You know, just like I did him. Y'all follow? Almost verbatim. And I listen and they're talking about the third step prayer. About the time the coffee gets ready, I look around the corner and I hear the, the chairs on the concrete. All right, you ready? Okay, this is going to, you sure? Yeah. And I hear the concrete, the chairs moving back. And the little guy gets on his knees on one side of the little table. And the other guy gets on his knees on the other side of the table. You don't have to memorize it. Just open it up right here, buddy. This is what we're reading right here. You, you good? And they hold hands across. 
I've yet to tell it without crying. Picture of Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob on the wall. Less than a generation ago, folks. Less than a generation ago, these 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 guys that couldn't couldn't not drink got together and brought a spiritual solution to us. And here we are downstream. Because some guy grabbed me that night and said, I'm going to sponsor your ass. Come on, let's go. Mark Houston got me five years later. And for 17 years, he tutored and, gu- and guided me so my ego wouldn't explode. And I'm sitting there watching these two little guys under the picture of Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob carry on that legacy. And they do that little third step prayer and then he just said the same thing. Next, we launched out our course of vigorous action. All right, you ready to start this fourth step? Okay, let's go. And then they notice I'm there and everything changes. You know, they get back, oh... They get up, you know, all in. <laughs> Until you've seen that, guys, you don't know what it's like. This is why I'm going to close, folks. Every one of you in here, I was talking to little sister at the workshop. Every one of you in here need to understand, I hope you understand my passion and where I'm coming from here. Bill Wilson says, and up in his front, up in the story, he says, each of us in our own way are going to carry the message. Guys, we don't need another Chris Raymer. Got one. Thank you. <laughs> no, because some of you guys go into media beating people up and with a big book and trying to jam it. You know, you got to do this. To work the steps or die, mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I can't even do that and get away with it. Stop beating people up with a big book. Don't need to. But you need to carry the message of hope. And nobody gets let off the hook. And each in our own way. Somebody comes up to you. I saw it the other night. I'm in a meeting. I shared. Everybody laughed. It was a good meeting. Little guy starts coming towards me. I'm thinking, oh, shit, here we go. You know, I really don't have time to sponsor another. I sponsor a whole bunch of guys, you know, and I do. And I really don't have time to. I got travel and pushed me aside. Got the guy behind me. (laughs) My little guy. I've sponsored this guy for about six months. Pushed, pushed. He didn't even share. He says, I heard you the other night share, and I was hoping maybe you could sponsor me. And I'm thinking, like, what? What am I? Chop liver? What? What? <laughs> Guys, because that's how it is. I don't know how it's going to be. Some people need it right in, their, in a, an abrasion. Like, I'm, pick me. I'm your. And some people need to be approached very gently, very kindly, with very soft. They're, they're so much, they're just a bundle of nerves. They don't need me in their face. I don't talk like this in my meetings anyway, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Each of us in our own little way. God gave you the the specific talents. The problem is getting you off dead center to do it. Because we got too many people out there telling people they can't do it. And if I've got off the podium here, I'm just soapbox it for 10 seconds and let you guys go. Guys, we don't have enough people in the trench to tell people that they don't have, they can't sponsor. It's your absolute God-given right and duty to sponsor newcomers. Get you some. Get it all over you. It absolutely blows me away. Listen, some, part of my job in, in, in treatment is trying to help people get connected. I was talking to Carl earlier, trying to get somebody connected in, in, in L.A. I do it. I network with the numbers. Amazing to me how many times I'll call an area looking for somebody. I'm not asking you to sponsor them. I'm asking you to just, can you catch them? Can you take them to a good home group where there's some, some recovery being talked about? Amazing to me how many people will turn me down. Well, I really don't think I'm ready for that. You, you, you'll never be ready for that. Y'all don't, don't you understand? Were you ready for sex the first time? Absolutely not. Don't you lie to me. I, I'm, I'm telling you. I, I remember my I, I did it. Oh, at least I got through that. Okay. The next one will be better. Come on, we get better with practice. I understand that. But everybody needs to get in there and do it. I was around in the early 80s uh, when uh, the treatment center industry was, was in its heyday because of the Hughes Act in the early 70s when it was passed. We had treatment centers opening on every corner. And I got to tell you guys, the buses from the hospitals would come pull up and we'd have 15 or 20 patients come into every meeting every day. These people would come into the meetings. We weren't ready. A lot of those people didn't get the sponsorship that we got. We just flat were outnumbered because you can't sponsor till you've been sober a year. I'm so grateful that Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob didn't know that. Dr. Bob sponsored over 5,000 people in his 15 years of life. He didn't sponsor it like some of y'all are sponsoring. You're taking these people on to raise. Quit it. Your job is to get them through the steps and get them connected to God. That's all we need you to do. If you get to be friends with them, great. If you don't, that's fine too. Make sense? Sponsor's not a friend. Sponsor's a teacher. 
That's what we, we need your help in the trench. There was an old guy, buddy. I'll end with it. He said, he, he saw me after a meeting. Everybody else, the room emptied. Everybody else was downstairs uh, getting dates and all that. I was all freaked out. I was up here helping him clean the coffee cups. And, and uh, he looked over his little glasses, had them just like that. And they were kind of misted up. And I said, buddy, what? Is that the, are you? I thought it was a steam from the sink. He, this guy was crying. He was 30. His name was ML. He was 30 years sober at the time. And uh, he looked over at me. He said, buddy, I heard you sharing the meeting tonight. You made you cracked me up. You remind me of me when I was was first getting here. And I, I'm just, I'm just, we, we appreciate your excitement in that meeting. And I, I just got to tell you, I'm, I, I'm lax because I haven't told you this before. We need you. Come on, guys. Go. Nobody's told me that we need you to leave. We need you not to come back. You'll follow. We need you to step out of the car and put your hands on. Yeah, no. <laughs> we need you. Every one of you in here, you little young guys picking up the chips, you brand new little baby, we need you. I'm going to tell you something, folks. The older I get, I just turned 60. You old geezers, you old mossbacks that I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't wait to get away from early on. I can't wait to sit and have coffee with you. Because there's so much of my life I don't understand. Everything shifted at 60. What? It's the hair growing out of your ear. <laughs> no, I know that's got nothing to do with Alcoholics Anonymous, and I guarantee you I'm not going to talk about it in a meeting. I got this hair coming out of my ear. But we're going to go have coffee, and I'm going to find out what this nonsense is about. <laughs> Are you supposed to let it grow? Are you supposed to shave? What are you? I don't know. You know, <laughs> guys, I don't know what it's like. I'm 26 years sober. I don't have a clue how to stay sober 27 years. For every one of you old guys standing around with a big book with duct tape around it, beating that thing, and standing at attention and helping people get well, thank you for sticking. Thank you for not going to the church and going on back to your life and letting us sit here and take. Thank you for staying. We need every one of you here. Thank you very much.